In the final section of this module, we're going to cover the uh, adaptations to skeletal muscle to both endurance and resistance training activities. Um, I think this is probably the most important part, and the idea behind how this all works is that each time you perform some type of exercise, whether it's endurance or resistance, you are um, putting a stress on that muscle that was not there. The idea is that this small stress is enough that the muscle can handle the stress. It will then adapt to be better um, equipped to handle that stress um, in the future, and then therefore you will get a beneficial adaptation. Um, if you do that once, you get a small adaptation. If you continue to train over and over and over and over again, you will kind of stack these adaptations on top of each other, ultimately leading in chronic uh, exercise training that will produce uh, long-term um, big effects. So that's what we're really going to cover today is not these um, very minuscule uh, acute uh, effects, but this is chronic training. And, and usually, uh, at least in the research world, um, researchers will uh, con uh, consider chronic training uh, usually about 12 to 16 weeks. So uh, three to four months uh, is pretty normal to do a uh, some type of training study in order to, to show that. So uh, that's a, a good framework of what kind of timing we're looking at. So we're going to start with endurance training. The uh, kind of entire goal of the muscle when it is stressed by uh, aerobic training is to then, of course, become more aerobic, right? It needs to produce more energy so that it can, you know, do something like go out running. So the idea would be if you were endurance training, maybe you're doing something like a couch to a 5K if you're just trying to get into training or, or advising um, uh, some type of client to do that. And so the idea is that um, that one small stress, maybe the first workout would be lighter, but eventually you could work your up, way up to a 5K. And the idea would be at the beginning, that person wouldn't be very good at creating lots of ATP um, or energy in the, um, in the muscle, but by the end of the training protocol, uh, they would be able to complete a 5K, which would require um, lots of energy production. Uh, so in general, they're going to control two pathways in this. One is uh, is here. They're going to have an improved ability to get uh, oxygen in. We're going to talk about oxygen uh, in the metabolism section, but you guys should be pretty familiar with the idea of um, of oxygen consumption and aerobic metabolism. So two ways you can do it is one, you can get more oxygen from the blood. Two is you can have more equipment in the cell in order to um, produce more energy. Right. So what we're going to do is, as we'll see, this will be in, in blood flow and then in, in mitochondria here in these two, two topics. So let's talk about uh, what happens with endurance training adaptations. So the first is fiber type. I, I hit on this a little bit in the fiber typing section. Uh, there is, uh, or at least for a while, there was a pretty... Um, a pretty staunch opposition to the idea that we could have fiber tra transformations. Uh, this was back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, most people thought you were you are what you are. So uh, realistically, athletic performance is really driven by genetics. Um, now, as technologies have improved, in fact, Scott Trapp, who you saw in the other video, he can now take single muscle fibers, run them out in that gel electrophoresis, and he can actually see that one single muscle fiber uh, can actually uh, uh, produce uh, different uh, myosin ATPases within each single fiber as you train, and so you can kind of start to see these transitions. Uh, in general, as, as I talked about with those transitions, um, is in general a moderate transition. So you're not getting these wholehearted shifts. Uh, a sprinter is never going to become a world-class uh, endurance runner uh, based on genetics, but for uh, for the majority of people, yeah, we can get some shifts in general, although we're going to try to shift to an aerobic shift, and almost all of the shifts are going to be going from these uh, super fast fibers, the type 2BX um, uh, fibers, and then shifting to the type 2A fibers, which again, as you'll remember from your fiber type, as, as being uh, this like fast oxidative glycolytic, right, a, a combo of, of both worlds. So a little bit of that, uh, that takes a long time though. Transitions uh, do take a while, not often seen in that 12 to 16 a week window uh, in a lot of research. Um, and so sometimes that will take much longer. So the next one is an increase in metabolic machinery. So you guys should be familiar with the idea of mitochondria. If you were to ask uh, most people what their definition, they, you know, it's about the powerhouse of the cell, right? So that's your ATP generating uh, sites. Uh, so the idea is that these stresses, you need to start to produce more 
um, energy, and so mitochondria increase in number so that you can produce more ATP. Um, something that is actually pretty recent that's actually come out is not only do we increase the number of mitochondria, but we are also now seeing that the quality of mitochondria actually gets better too. Uh, so we're learning that as you uh, endurance exercise train, uh, you also uh, stimulate a process that breaks down mitochondria. And this idea is that you break down the older mitochondria, and so therefore you're making new mitochondria uh, in order to increase content, getting rid of the older mitochondria, and so you're getting kind of uh, uh, survival of the fittest. You're keeping your best mitochondria and making more that are even better. Therefore, you're increasing not only the number, but also the quality um, and health of those mitochondria. Uh, the second is, is, like we mentioned before, is an increase in uh, blood supply. You get more blood there, means you get more oxygen there, means that you can create more ATP from that oxygen. Um, uh, and the way that this is done is by increasing the number of capillaries surrounding the skeletal muscle fiber. Um, last but not least is we can change and alter the uh, metabolism, and this is uh, choosing the substrates that, we, um, that we're going to use. Um, for for ATP production. Uh, so we, we'll get more into this uh, in the metabolism section, but we'll just say this. You get much more ATP from breaking down uh, this long chain fatty acid uh, than you do from breaking down a glucose molecule. So as you train, you actually get better at breaking down fat than you do, uh, and you uh, reduce your uh, rate of carbohydrate breakdown. Again, that's just a way to increase the amount of ATP production from that. Uh, so one of the uh, kind of big parts uh, that has started to come out, and I, I talked about this in lab, but one of the reasons I really got into exercise physiology is the concept of exercise as medicine. So one of the, the really big problems uh, that we see in a lot of diseases uh, is that mitochondria start to function really poorly in things like aging uh, with uh, disuse, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, we see very poor mitochondrial function uh, in uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Um, and so the idea that I got into this was kind of for exercise as medicine, really focusing on this idea of, of mitochondria. And so here's a look just specifically at the mitochondria and what it takes to um, increase uh, mitochondrial uh, content in skeletal muscle. So again, uh, this is a really classic figure, an untrained person. As we begin to train, you will start to see kind of these small adaptations, mitochondrial number, stack, stack, stack again. Uh, this is a little bit early, so we'll see plateau probably about eight uh, to 10 weeks. We'll start to see mitochondrial number actually double in size with, uh, um, with exercise training. Um, if you stop training, right, we start to see as you would expect, so halfway through, we would lose the rate of mitochondria actually about the same rate in which we gained it such that it only takes about five weeks to get back to, to baseline, or you can take a week off or say you got injured, uh, you can actually gain that back relatively quickly. So these mitochondria are a very dynamic source. You make them uh, relatively quickly uh, in adaptations and you lose them just as quickly. Uh, one thing that we'll note though is that uh, the mitochondria adaptations are intensity dependent. Right, so if you um, are training, um, the more intense you're training, the more uh, mitochondrial volume will go up. Uh, that's for two reasons. So one of the primary reasons that intensity is such an important factor in uh, mitochondrial volume in the whole muscle going up is because uh, you only recruit uh, those type 2BX fibers at really high intensity exercises. At low intensity exercises, you're really recruiting a lot of high oxidative fibers. And while, yes, you can get some um, mitochondrial content increase in those, at these high intensities, you get an increase not only here, but also here. And so you uh, really start to adapt these, uh, uh, these type 2BX uh, fibers, maybe even transition them into uh, type 2A fibers. And so therefore, at these high intensities, you're not only affecting type 1s, as you can see here in the uh, less intense training, but in these high intense trainings, then you can uh, increase mitochondrial there. Um, <coughs> and then here are some uh, mitochondrial content, again, just looking at uh, training programs from um, mild to severe. This is, um, in theory, just uh, looking at mitochondrial um, runtime. Uh, 
mild intensity, uh, despite the fact that they may be running a long time if they are uh, not really stressing or creating uh, any stress, any type of intense workout, then you get uh, less mitochondrial adaptations. The higher the intensity you go from A to B to C to D, uh, you get more and more mitochondria. This last point is uh, what's really interesting. So uh, this is something that's, uh, that wasn't um, a novel concept. In the, in the 80s, this is how a lot of people were training, and then we forgot about it, and now it's really kind of starting to boom in. And that's the idea of, of high-intensity exercise um, training. And so um, in this figure, you can see that if they're training really, really hard, you don't even have to work out that long. And that's become uh, kind of this new fad. Uh, and, I, and I put a question mark here for a reason. So high intensity exercise training is really doing super maximal all out bouts in a very short amount of time. So they'll work out for uh, as hard as they can go for about 30 uh, seconds, uh, rest for 45 minutes, do that again. So pretty common to do six sets of that. Uh, in theory, you're working out for um, uh, less than five minutes in this case. Um, and uh, getting some of the benefits. And so uh, there's starting to become lots of studies looking, at least in the short term, uh, there's been some studies showing that you can get the same mitochondrial adaptations uh, over, two week, over a two-week period doing this high-intensity interval training as going out and running for about 45 to 60 minutes a day. You get the same mitochondrial adaptation. Uh, there's lots of new studies that are starting to kind of take this out longer and compare and see if these are effects. And so it's still... Uh, um, still a little bit of a um, a little bit of an unknown about how well the adaptation works. Uh, I think one of the easy things to do is is we can probably combine those, right? Uh, so one of a really good workout plan may be to do a day of high intensity uh, uh, interval training or uh, HI, uh, IT or and then the next day do some type of long run and work it in that way. All right, so next we'll transition into strength training. Right? In general, for most people, the goal of strength training is to either maintain or grow muscle mass, right, to get bigger. And so uh, that is a very classic paradigm, right? So we can see muscle hypertrophy. This is an increase in the size of muscle fibers, uh, and it results from adding uh, new myofibrils existing fibers and making them bigger, right? So we're adding more sarcomeres, we're putting more actin, more myosin, the more cross bridges you can create, the more force you can create, and therefore the stronger you are, right? So the muscle grows by putting these in um, and working that way. It requires addition of myonuclei, aka when we talked about those satellite cells um, early on in this module, those satellite cells will come in and provide mononuclear support in order to make these proteins that we need to get bigger. So hypertrophy, growing of a single muscle fiber, very well established in the lab. Uh, we can uh, actually take pictures, circle them, uh, and show that our muscle fibers get much larger. Hyperplasia is an increase in the actual number of muscle fibers. We can see this very obviously in mice. Uh, and rats, and so this is uh, a lot of where this literature came from, is this idea that uh, mice and rats are putting brand new muscle fibers in, novo muscle fibers, so they're getting bigger and new fibers growing stronger that way. Uh, that is controversial in, in human literatures, and I think um, it's safest to say that most muscle mass gains are due to hypertrophy with little, uh, if any, due to hyperplasia. Um, and again, there's uh, plenty of studies out there that people will claim that this is happening, but it's really hard to do in a human. We can do it in a mouse. We can actually trace where fibers go, uh, trace where satellite cells go and, and see that. Uh, very hard to actually trace where a muscle cell goes. Um, and so uh, there, there are reports in the literature, if, you're, if you are digging around, that will support hyperplasia, but general consensus suggests it's, it's not a, um, a huge player. So what are some specific? Uh, one is that uh, our type 1 muscles, they don't really like to grow. Um, type 1 muscles get used all the time. Therefore, that adaptation stress that I mentioned uh, isn't really there. Right? Um, so if, as I'm standing here to give this lecture, my type 1 fibers, postural muscles, as we talked about, are, are working. Uh, they're being active. And if I do that daily, uh, those aren't really growing. So our best potential to grow are in our type 2B or X fibers or our type 2A fibers. Uh, these have a much greater potential to grow because they're not used all the time. Therefore, they respond to this uh, stress and adapt much better. Uh, in general, again, that same timeline usually takes place. Um, 
in, in a lot of training studies, but that's not uncommon. If you've uh, gone from a novice to working out, you'll see that early on you can get really uh, rapid gains in strength. Um, however, if you were to take an MRI, you would not really be able to see much hypertrophy, at least not hypertrophy that, that is equal to the uh, length of strength gains. Uh, that is going to be due to the neural component. We'll hit that up um, later on in this unit. But long term, uh, after about eight weeks, uh, we know that strength gains are attributable to um, this increase in proteins in the muscle, making it get bigger and hypertrophy and being able to work stronger. So we have two great benefits, right? So we've talked about exercise as medicine. I, I gave you a really good idea of resistance exercise training. Uh, we get a little bit of mitochondrial adaptation in resistance training, uh, but not near the uh, increase in mitochondrial content. Um, and so uh, a good question posed is, is which is better, aerobic exercise or resistance training? So this is a, an article I pulled out of circulation, uh, kind of comparing the two. Um, this was a, 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 a statement put out by the American Heart Association that, that really went through this and showing how these two compare. So we get great benefits in bone, uh, we get decrease in fat, skeletal muscle, uh, increase in lean body mass is only seen in resistance training, so that's good. Of course, strength goes up. Strength is really important maybe for like an aging person uh, so that they can uh, continue uh, activity of day, daily living. Uh, both of these are actually very beneficial to uh, diabetic type patients. If you're interested in that, we get uh, a decrease in insulin levels, increase in sensitivity to insulin, and uh, removal of glucose goes up much faster in a, in a uh, glucose tolerance test. Um, we uh, see uh, a little bit of the uh, cholesterol benefits. Uh, seen with training that are, are well known. Um, however, one of the big limitations is uh, in cardiovascular disease. And I know we, I had one uh, person in their Flipgrid intro kind of ask about a little bit about uh, cardiovascular disease and, and how that works. So realistically, resistance training is going to have minimal effect on cardiovascular um, effects. So heart rate isn't affected, uh, blood pressure not really um, affected. We'll see some, some moderate decreases in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, no real decreases seen with resistance exercise training. We don't get this uh, aerobic capacity increase um, effect at all. Um, and so uh, realistically for cardiovascular disease, uh, resistance exercise, while I would still promote it, it's great for health, may not be the best case scenario or something like diabetes, again, would be very beneficial, either aerobic or resistance. So which one? Well, that's a good question. So the next con um, next thoughts are, are um, again, a new, pretty popular research uh, area um, called concurrent training. Uh, to be honest, um, I was a part of one of these studies, and they are not fun to do, right? You're, you're tra chasing a whole bunch of people. You're um, trying to figure out how to structure uh, the workouts. Um, you are trying to match volumes or make sure they're doing the same amount of work. Um, and then... Uh, it's just kind of a logistical nightmare. And for that reason, not a lot of, um, a lot of research really try to do these uh, studies um, all that well. Second, it takes a lot of manpower, so it costs a lot of money to be able to do that. And then graduate students never want to do these because they take forever to complete and will take forever to graduate. So we'll just kind of go over, but the idea is that you do both an aerobic and a resistance um, type. Uh, so there is some thoughts that uh, strength can be compromised due to um, the endurance training. And that, that theory is that you're, um, in general, you're needing all this adaptation and energy and, and putting all your folks on building muscle. If you take away to do something like help build mitochondria, then you um, are kind of taking away those resources that could be building um, muscle as well. Uh, and a suggestion that power may be compromised more than strength. Um, uh, we can maybe have anaerobic performance decrease due to endurance training, um, but our aerobic portion isn't affected really at all, right? So in my cardiovascular example, um, cardiovascular disease example, you can resistance train for health and not worry about those cardiovascular effects being beneficial. Uh, realistically, for the general population, uh, I mean, doing both is great, right? Uh, this is really hitting at, at some like people who are trying to work on performance and how that works. Um, so just be aware that you 
you can uh, maybe have some interference in that in the strength gains due to uh, the aerobic side of things. Aerobic doesn't seem to be compromised. Um, so with that, that I'll end our um, lesson for the day. Um, as always, uh, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, or uh, found any of this interesting and want some outside uh, reading that I can just give you to, to read on your own, I'm happy to share. Uh, send me an email and get in contact.